200 years of Mendel, from peas to personalised medicine. The hashtag for this event is Mendel Pet, and this event has been made possible thanks to the kind support of Genomics England. This event is a celebratory one, really, marking the 200th birthday of Gregor Mendel, a scientist and a monk whose insights, although initially overlooked, eventually earned him the reputation as the father of genetics. I think it's fair to say that Mendel helped revolutionise our understanding of biological inheritance and consequently human health and disease. And he generalised from patterns he observed in pea plants. So those of you um, who are wondering why we have peas in the title, because you're not familiar with Mendel, we'll, we'll um, start putting two and two together. Um, and he, he used those those observations to propose his laws of inheritance, um, which it transpired were applicable not just to pea plants, but to most plants and animals, including humans. And so school pupils can blame him for having to learn about dominant and recessive inheritance. Mendel's is not the only big birthday this year, and as part of PET's 30 30th birthday celebrations, we commissioned research into public attitudes and understanding of fertility, genomics and embryo research. Uh, this research was undertaken by Ipsos and they asked 2000 and odd people um, in the UK questions ranging from what term best describes the human genome. So ones about their attitudes to different types of direct to, to consumer genetic tests. And there were lots, lots more questions, which I don't have time to go into, but I just wanted to give you um, one little example. So we asked a question about um, their attitudes to the use of whole genome sequencing um, of newborn babies. And the research found that the majority of respondents supported the use of whole genome sequencing to screen newborn babies for a larger number of rare conditions than is screened for using current methods. Now, this is really significant, I think, because Genomics England, as many of you may know, is currently investigating this approach with its newborn genomes programme research pilot. And our findings do indicate that the public may very well be receptive to this work. And this initiative is something that we'll hear more about from our final speaker, um, David Bick. And you can read PET's full report um, on our website. Now, moving from PET's insights and back to Mendel's, I think his have only become more important with time. Genetics and latterly genomics, which considers our genomes in their entirety rather than just um, looking at one little little itty bitty gene, um, are increasingly important in medicine and advances in these fields are key to achieving uh, the promise of personalised medicine where treatments are optimised for particular patients. And tonight, so we're really considering science and medicine um, and what they've um, inherited from Mendel because he was the father of genetics after all, um, as well as looking to the future. So what are the prospects for understanding and treating Mendelian disorders in the era of whole genome sequencing? And how are we tackling genetic conditions that don't follow Mendelian patterns of inheritance? So um, there's lots, I think, to, to discuss, to learn and to get our teeth into. And I'm thrilled now um, to, um, to say that we have an amazing lineup for you. We have Dr. John Parrington, Dr. Gemma Chandratilaka, Angela Douglas, Vivian Parry, and Dr. David Bick. John is the author of the books, The Deeper Genome, Redesigning Life, and Mind Shift. He is also an associate professor of cellular, cellular and molecular pharmacology at the University of Oxford. So I was asked to give uh, an introduction about Mendel's work and situate it in his time and also a bit about what happened after Mendel's great discoveries. And so I thought an important place to start, Mendel was published his, his major findings in 1865. And that was only six years after Darwin had published his famous book, The Origin of Species. And I thought it was just worth looking briefly at Darwin's theory of evolution, looking at how that contrast to another theory of evolution by Lamarck, and then see why Mendel's ideas turned out to be a, a, an incredible next step forward. Because 
is, is famously known. Darwin came up with the idea of um, evolution by natural selection. Actually, wasn't the only person. There was Albert Russell Wallace, who simultaneously at the same time uh, came up with a similar idea. And it was interesting, it's interesting to contrast this with Lamarck's idea. Lamarck had put forward a theory of evolution about 50 years, I think, before that. And we can illustrate the differences between the two theories by looking at giraffe evolution. So obviously what's happened during the process of evolution of giraffes is that their necks have got longer. And Lamarck thought this was because in striving to reach the top leaves on, on the trees, somehow that was then this sort of striving was passed on to the next generation. So the next generation of giraffes had, had a, a longer neck. Very interesting revolutionary ideas for its time. But the big problem with that theory was, well, what was explaining this this kind of striving what was the me mechanistic basis and, there were, and Lamarck could never really answer that and Darwin's theory of, of natural selection was revolutionary because it provided a mechanism so what Darwin said was that what happens in, in evolution is you've got a population of animals in a, in a species and uh, there'll be different variants within that population so in a, a population of giraffes there will be some giraffes that have just by, by various different factors between them they will have longer necks and because those giraffes will be more suited to survive in that and they'll be more able to get the top leaves on the trees that gives them a survival advantage and therefore they're more likely to survive and pass on their inheritance whatever that is to the next generation and, and that's how you eventually over millions of years you get longer neck giraffes now darwin did actually have a problem with this theory it was a brilliant theory and became obviously very famous but he never really explained how that business of passing on characteristics to the next generation really works. And in fact, the idea at the time that there was something passed on through the blood, you know, we still even talk about it's in the blood that comes from that kind of era, never really explained how, how this could really work. Because if you think about it, if you just mix in blood, surely any kind of difference between individuals would, would kind of get evened out. And what Mendel's great discovery uh, was, was, was to show how, inheritance works so he's gone very famous for his work on peas he worked on peas in the monastery where he was a monk and later became an abbot um, actually he did start working on mice it wasn't his first choice of organism but the, the bishop uh, of, of Bruno which was the, the, the area so this was all happening in Bruno um, in, in what's now the Czech Republic and um, Mendel was originally wanted to study inheritance in mice but when the bishop of the local area got wind of this, that a celibate monk was, was basically observing animals having sex. He said, this is not on the car, the celibate monk's doing this kind of thing. So instead, he, he, he said, you're going to have to find another organism. Now, as Mendel himself noted, it was lucky the bishop didn't know that plants also have sex, because that's exactly the case. But it didn't, it, it did allow him to carry on his work. And I think what was really important about the work that Mendel did was to take very defined characteristics of, of the pea plants he worked on. So it could be long or short plants or plants with wrinkled pods or smooth pods. So very distinctive characteristics. And then he crossed the different types, so short with long, and, and then looked at what happened in the next generation. And, and the real, I think, revolution side of what he did was to then count the numbers of the offspring. So that was the first time that quantitation had been used to look at inheritance rather than just you know, qualitative look at it. And, and as, as, as has already been mentioned, as Sarah already mentioned, one of the revolutionary aspects of, of Mendel's work and, and what he basically showed was there's a, a dominant kind of inheritance and there's a recessive inheritance. Basically, we have two copies of every gene. So Mendel himself didn't coin the word gene, but that's what they became known as. So factors, he called them. Um, so there'd be two factors in, in any, for any particular characteristic. And if you've got um, a dominant condition, then it, all you need is one of these uh, factors to, 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 to have the characteristic, to, to, to be to the factor. Whereas if it's a recessive characteristic, you need, you need two. And that's only going to occur if uh, uh, occasionally in generations. So dominant will, will be every single generation, whereas recessive characteristics can sometimes skip a generation. Now, the relevance of all this for human disease is that human characteristics and human diseases often fo follow a, a Mendelian um, uh, pattern of, 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 of inheritance. And in fact, as has already been mentioned, one of the, one of the sad things earlier about Mendel's life and work was that in his lifetime, his work was never recognised for the revolutionary uh, 
aspects that it had, it, it was really skipped. Uh, people didn't really get his numbers and all these kind of things. And it was only in 1900 after he'd already died that his work was rediscovered. And it's interesting that uh, then a, a clinician, uh, actually Oxford graduate, uh, Archibald Garrett, who was said to be more interested in his, he, he was a urologist, so he studied patient urine and, and disease of urine. And he was said to be more interested in in the urine than the patients themselves. So not the best bedside manner, but he was fa- passionately interested in the science uh, of, of, of illness. And what he noted was that in some of the patients they were studying, who had this very strange condition where they had bl- urine that turned black. Um, and, it, and, and he noticed that it skipped generations. So he went to talk to a friend of his um, who was working in Cambridge University, um, uh, who mentioned, oh, well, there's this new new discovery of, of the work of Gregor Mendel, and, and it could be relevant. And of course it was. And we now know that that uh, it w- w- is a, a recessive condition that it was looking at. So lots of relevance for human disease in ways that are going to be talked about later. Um, but what I wanted to also now talk a bit about was uh, what happened after Mendel's great discovery. Because as I said, it was rediscovered, the, the importance of his work after his death. And, and that led then to a huge upsurge of people trying to understand what what our genes what, I mean for Mendel there were just these hypothetical, hypothetical things but what do they actually mean in terms of objects within the body and, and we can look to Thomas Hunt Morgan who worked at Columbia University uh, in the early 20th century for that discovery of what genes really are because M- Morgan decided to work on fruit flies as, a, as an organism that you could they have that we produce very rapidly. You could study many, many of them at the same time. And what he noted was that the exact same patterns of inheritance that Mendel had identified in peas were also relevant for animals. So he showed the dominant and the recessive inheritance. But he also noticed a very interesting case of, of an inherited characteristic, which was a mutant um, eye color. So basically, fruit flies normally have red eyes. But he noted that certain fruit flies, if you left, if you looked long enough and looked for kind of natural occurring mutants, they had the white eyes, which because they had a lack of the pigment that causes the red eye. And he noticed that, as, as shown in, in the slide here, that this only occurs in males. So this seemed to go against what Mendel had said, because he never mentioned anything about inheritance being linked to sex. And it was actually this discovery of, of males only having the mutation that led Morgan to make the connection between genes and chromosomes. Because at the time, it was known that chromosomes were something to do with inheritance, but it wasn't clear exactly what. Um, but the, it had already been discovered that, the, that females have an XX chromosome and males have an XY set of chromosomes. And this is true of people as, as much as, uh, fruit flies as much as people. And he made that connection to realize that actually this was a case of extinct um, inheritance. So now this is relevant to diseases like uh, haemophilia and um, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, to name just a few of the excellent con- recessive conditions, where the male is the only people that tends to get these disorders because a female is protected by having two X chromosomes, whereas a male with only one X chromosome, there's nothing to shield that mutation from, from showing its presence. But the real significant breakthrough was, was showing that genes are affected beyond chromosomes. Another person I think we really should mention in talking about the history of genetics is Barbara McClintock, who discovered all sorts of different aspects of, of, of how chromosomes work. She discovered the centromere, which is the center of the chromosome that helps it divide in a dividing cell. She discovered the telomere that helps to protect the ends of the chromosome. But one of the things that she's most known for, and the thing that eventually led her to get a Nobel Prize, uh, I should have mentioned also that, that um, Morgan also was awarded a Nobel Prize for, for his work. But Barbara McClintock was awarded the Nobel Prize quite late in, in life, actually, in the 1980s, when she was already in her 80s. And one of the reasons, I think, was, well, partly because I think she was a woman and women's work often was, was sidelined at that time, but also because she discovered a very curious aspect of, 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 of the genome, which is that you have these so-called jumping genes or mobile DNA elements. Jumping genes are a bit of a misnomer because it's not really genes in, as, as a whole that tend to jump, but bits of DNA that, that jump uh, within the chromosome. And this has massive relevance in terms of disease because some diseases are linked to this kind of instability in genomes. But what was, I think, the revolutionary aspect of what McClintock said about this process was that she saw it as a potentially creative way of, of scrambling the genome at certain periods of stress. So she linked it to environmental stress. And it it's now seems pretty clear that at certain points in, 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 in history uh, of evolution, stress, environmental stress can trigger 
major instances of this transposition of, of elements around the genome and it seems to have a creative role in, in evolution and sort of challenge the idea that evolution is just this very gradual thing that occurs you know nucleotide DNA nucleotide base by base and it, it can actually be much more radical in, in certain circumstances and and so the transition from invertebrates to vertebrates apes to humans seems to have been accompanied by a lot of these transmission events I won't say much about the discovery of the DNA double helix it was a major discovery and in 1953, so that was about 100 years after uh, Mendel's great findings, um, Darwin's discovery of the, of the mechanism of, of evolution, and, the, and DNA itself was actually first isolated in the 1860s. So it took 100 years for people to somehow bring all these things together. And I think the real relevance of the discovery of the double helix as it's shown here, it basically shows that the DNA, which, it, well, first of all, it, it helped to confirm that DNA is the stuff of life, the stuff of inheritance, but also it showed a mechanism for the replication of DNA. Basically, there's two strands of DNA that split apart and then form new uh, helices. But it also showed that uh, a mechanism for how DNA works in the inheritance model, but also a, a, as a blueprint for the cells. So basically, the information in the sequence of, of bases shown here in DNA are then transcribed into RNA and then these are then translated into the sequence of amino acids that make up proteins and this is relevant because proteins do lots of important things within a cell you could say they're both the building blocks the engines and also all sorts of the functions in a cell and up till then it wasn't clear where that kind of information and, 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 and proteins came from. So it showed that there's a kind of code in life, code in the DNA that's translated into a code in the proteins. And from that, we, we've got ideas that, such as Francis Crick put forward, such as that there's, there's a kind of a dogma, as he called it, a central dogma, whereby information in the DNA is, is then transcribed into the RNA and then, and then appears in the protein. Although it was a revolutionary idea at the time, I think we have to be careful of this because what we're starting to learn is the idea of DNA being just the blueprint actually is really challenged now by what we're learning about the complexity of the genome. So I just want to end with a few slides talking about what we've discovered from the Human Genome Project. So we've learned lots and amazing things from the Human Genome Project. Perhaps one of the most startling uh, aspects of what we learned about the genome over recent decades has been the fact that actually genes, if we define these as protein coding, like segments of DNA are only 2%, less than 2% of the genome. And what we're starting to learn is that there's a whole aspect of the genome that's not the protein coding genes, the so-called non-coding genome. So what are we learning from, from, from what we, we, we about this non-coding genome? Well, one thing we can say is that the 3D structure of the chromosome seems to be actually key to how the chromosome, how the genome actually works. We're also learning that far from just being a messenger, RNA, so it was thought that RNA was basically just a kind of intermediary between DNA and protein. We're learning that RNA, so-called regulatory RNAs, can play all sorts of important roles in the cell and in the organism. And RNAs can even travel between cells and transmit information from one part of the body to the other. And we're also learning that the complexity of how genes are turned on or off by gene switches is far more complex than we ever realized. So lots and lots of complexity, which might think, well, that's difficult. That makes it harder to explain what's really going on. But I think it really shows just what an interesting and, 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 and exciting entity the genome is. And I think just to end then, uh, what I'm saying, we then got to think, well, how is the genome influenced by the environment? So one of the, the important aspects of, of the non-coding genome is that it's one way in which the environment makes its mark on, on the genome. So going back to what we've said earlier on about evolution um, by natural selection, there's an idea that's kind of crept into our discussions about evolution, that it's all about kind of gradual changes, all about gradual changes in, um, in the basis of, of, of the DNA. And that's basically what's really going on there. Whereas the concept of the epigenome, which is everything that occurs essentially out to the genome besides changing the actual basis, is showing that both in terms of understanding how different cell, cell types differ within the body. So why is it that heart cell is like a heart cell and a neuronal cell is completely different in the kind of proteins and what's going on there? It's because the epigenome of those different cell types is absolutely different from, from each other in the different cell types, even though the genome itself is basically the same. And also more controversial and challengingly, it also raises the question of whether 
ep these epigenetic changes can be passed down through generations. And there is starting to be evidence that both in terms of chemical changes to the DNA, but also the RNA species that I've talked about, the regulatory RNAs, they can transmit information from generation to generation. So there's evidence, for instance, that certain regulatory RNAs can pass on anxiety and stress uh, to the next generation, at least in, in my studies. More positively and more kind of, so if that sounds worrying, that we can pass on stress to our, you know, to our offspring uh, through, our, through, through their genomes. There's also good evidence that more positive experience in life can also have an impact on the next generation. So it does show that what we do in our lifetimes has a much more, much more, much bigger effect than, than we'd ever realized if we were just thinking about the DNA sequence alone. So I'll end it there. There's going to be lots more discussion about the relevance of all this to, to medicine and, and what it means to be human. Gemma is the chair of the Society for Genetic Medicine, and she's also chair of the Cambridge Rare Disease Network. Gemma is also um, education and training lead at the East Genomic Laboratory Hub. Um, I'm Gemma tanner Tilliger, and I'm going to be picking up from where John left off and really talking about um, how these concepts of genes that John has mentioned um, uh, apply to healthcare. So it, well, we'll talk about genes to genomic medicine. So I'll just start off with a couple of definitions so that everybody's on the same page. Um, as John has mentioned, the word genome, um, we think of a genome as an individual's genetic information made up of DNA. It contains genes, but lots of other DNA too. And when it comes to genes, these are the particular sequences of DNA in the genome that are required for the production of a functional product. And you can think of these as sort of the analogous to Mendel's units of inheritance. These are the individual things that code for individual traits. And we have more than 20,000 um, genes in the human genome. So when we study individual genes, we are doing genetics, um, just like Mendel. And when we are looking at our whole complement of DNA, or when we're looking at lots and lots of genes and other DNA at once, um, we are doing genomics. And we're really able to do genomics now, um, sort of the last um, 10, 20 years. Um, and that's been driven by technological advances. So um, the first of those being the Human Genome Project, um, so this, the big scientific um, stories, but then also advances in technology, because genomics in itself is a big data science because our genomes are big and contain a lot of information. So if we go back to how all of this um, relates to healthcare, um, you have the field of medical genetics, and really this has been largely consumed with um, um, thinking about and studying and, and talking with patients um, who um, are affected by conditions that are caused by um, differences in single genes. So these genes display, um, these conditions display Mendelian inheritance patterns, as John mentioned. And for quite some time now, um, um, patients have been offered counselling about the inheritance of these conditions. And as time has gone on, we've been able to identify the genes that give rise to these particular conditions, such as sickle cell anemia, alpha thalassemia, Huntington's disease, cystic fibrosis, um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. And as the, these genes have been discovered, um, pa um, patients or people who are affected by these conditions have been able to be offered genetic tests to, the, to themselves and to their family members um, affected by these conditions. So why, why do we do this? Why is this done in, in, in healthcare? Um, you know, the, so people have said, well, it's not particularly useful to find a genetic diagnosis for individuals because there are no treatments for these conditions. Um, so this is really, I want to counter that, 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 that statement. Um, you know, there are increasingly um, treatments um, and preventative care measures that can be um, offered to um, individuals who are affected by these, rare, these, these genetic conditions. Um, but also what's really important is that if you have a particular healthcare condition and you are, and nobody really knows what it is, and you are seeing doctor doctor after doctor after doctor and you're having test after test after test and that's incredibly psychologically um, draining um, um, on you as an individual it's also very financially costly to a healthcare system so it, it's 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 really desirable to get to an answer um, as, as sort of early as as, as possible um, to provide a, a, to, to sort of put an end to a necessary testing and treatment and to provide an answer and a sense of closure to the individuals who are affected by these conditions so people People who are affected by genetic conditions, they can use that information um, for family planning purposes. They can have counselling around um, 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 
the, the chance that a, a child may have a, a particular genetic condition and that facilitates them to make decisions about if or how to have children. Um, it can facilitate prenatal testing um, or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is an IVF mediated pathway. Um, other family members may be at risk for particular conditions and that maybe that they are able to benefit from early interventions if, if genetic testing is available for them. Um, um, if um, having having a name for a condition is also just helpful in itself, knowing knowing what condition you you have means that you can participate in a more relevant support or advocacy group for that condition, and this is really helpful um, for for, for um, individuals who are affected by um, these genetic conditions. And increasingly, there are. Um, targeted therapies for these for these conditions and um, having knowing which one you have enables you to potentially benefit from such treatments or to participate in clinical trials for that condition. So traditionally this has been um, very difficult though because these genetic conditions for the most part are, are pretty rare in the population. So um, rare, the definition of a rare condition is that it affects less than one in 2000 in the population and 80% of rare conditions have a genetic basis, but there's a real lack of awareness in the healthcare system about such conditions and they're very difficult to diagnose. You kind of need to know what your answer is before you are able to sequence a particular gene. You need to know which gene you wanted to look at. And there are lots of these conditions. So even though they're individually rare, they actually affect a lot of people. Um, about one in 17 people or greater than 3 million people in the UK are affected by rare conditions. Um, and so this has led to the phenomenon of the diagnostic odyssey, which just means that it takes a long time. It's very difficult for people to get an answer when they have these kinds of conditions. Um, so um, that's the kind of status quo. Um, but from the last sort of 20 years, um, where we've had the Human Genome Project, and then we've had the emergence of technologies such as microarray technologies and advances in DNA sequencing technologies and concurrent advances in our computational powers, um, we, we're able now to do um, genomics rather than just genetics. Um, and so we can now bring um, this technology and science to bear in our healthcare practice. So what does that mean? It really just means that when we're doing genomic medicine, we're using information from um, an individual person's DNA sequence to inform their medical care. So we could be making a diagnosis or providing prognostic information. We could predict the risk that someone might go on to develop a particular condition and maybe be able to offer some preventative care measures. We can use this information for family planning purposes, for the individual's concerns. Um, there's a whole field called pharmacogenetics, which I'll talk a bit more about later, um, where we can predict the efficacy of particular medications for individuals and we can also prevent um, individuals having adverse drug reactions um, and um, I think I'd be remiss given the, the pandemic not to mention the fact that we can use genomics in infectious disease and medicine as well. So going back to our, um, our rare diseases and our rare conditions, um, what, what has genomics brought to the table? Um, so rather than having to look at a particular individual gene and know which one we wanted to look at, we're now able to use um, the advances in DNA sequencing technology to in interrogate lots of genes up to the whole genome at once. And this helps us to identify the genetic cause of a disorder without having to um, do lots of sequential genetic testing. And in that way, we can do away with the diagnostic odyssey for a lot of people who are affected by these conditions. And this has really made it to the clinic since about 2011, when the first clinical test of this type was offered in the US. Um, and it's increasingly, um, spreading around the world in developed healthcare systems and increasingly becoming the standard of care to take this kind of approach in diagnosing rare conditions. And if we, if we um, look at the diagnostic um, rate um, using these technologies, where, where we can make diagnosis for about 25 to 40% of individuals who are having these kinds of tests. Um, and this has really led to an explosion in the discovery of genes that cause rare conditions as well. So moving on from the rare, rare disease, rare condition space and thinking about other aspects of healthcare, when we move into the cancer um, world, um, um, cancer obviously affects a lot of people in the population, but what we're able to do is um, look at the DNA of the tumor. And the reason we do this is because cancer is actually a, a genetic condition. It is caused by changes in the genome of the cells in the tumor, causing them to grow in an unregulated way. So what we can do is we can look at the DNA from the tumor, and that enables us to make a very precise diagnosis around the type of cancer that an individual has. And that in turn guides treatment and management with respect to that cancer. It helps us to use drugs that would actually work for that patient, um, 
first time and avoid drugs that won't work. And that's important because a lot of chemotherapeutic agents um, um, have, have very um, difficult side effects. And so we don't want to be giving those people for whom they won't work. Um, and increasingly, um, clinical trials for cancer require um, knowledge of the genetic basis of the tumor. So moving on to thinking about the medicines themselves, the drugs, um, um, I mentioned the field of pharmacogenetics. And I think everybody on this call will, will know inherently that different people respond to different drugs in different ways. People just, people understand this. So why is that? It's because of changes in, it's because of differences in our, in our genetic material. And this means that different people are differentially sensitive to medications. So it may be that different doses are required to achieve therapeutic effects. And we also know that some drugs just don't work for some people. Also, some people um, experience really severe side effects from drugs. And this is a big problem for the healthcare system. We don't want to be giving people medicines that will hurt, hurt them. So the, this whole field is, is around thinking about doing genetic or genomic testing prior to the prescription of medication in order to be smarter about the medicines that we prescribe. If we think about common diseases like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, um, genomics has really been applied in this space as well. And in, in these um, cases, there have been large case control studies that have revealed lots of different genetic variants that affect our risk of developing these common diseases. Now, there are lots and lots of variants that have been identified, and these variants are common in the population. It's not like rare disease where they're, they're, they're very rare variants that we're dealing with. These are common variants in the population and each variant affects our risk of developing these common disorders um, very slightly. So increases our risk or decreases our risk very slightly. But what you can do is you can sum all of those risks up together um, to get a score for an individual person. And it, it may be that um, we can use these risk scores to, to target our healthcare practices. So things like screening for cancer or screening for heart disease, we could target um, those who, to, um, to those individuals in the population who are most at risk of developing these conditions or start the screening at earlier ages, for example. And then again, as I alluded to earlier, um, when we're thinking about infectious disease and pathogens like bacteria and viruses, we're able to sequence the genomes of these organisms, of the bacteria or the viruses themselves, to help us identify the precise strain that we're dealing with um, and to understand um, the relationships between cases. And I think everybody's obviously become a lot more familiar with the applications of these technologies um, in this space in recent years. So just in, in conclusion then, um, the science and technology advances of the last 20 years have really um, facilitated genomics to be practiced in medicine. Um, but genomics alone is information, it, it, it's, it's big data, it's, it's information, and it, can, it cannot alone produce great healthcare. It needs to be effectively embedded in care pathways to really bring benefits to patients. Um, and because genomics is a big data science, it raises, you know, using genomics raises issues that we have to address in a trustworthy way to ensure maximum benefits in healthcare and, and equity of access as well to this to these advances. So, you know, it brings up questions around data sharing and having representational data sets. It gives me great pleasure now to introduce um, Angela Douglas, who is Deputy Chief Scientific Officer at NHS England. Genomics has had a long and rich history in the NHS, as we've already heard from some of the previous speakers. And from the first genetic tests that were actually introduced back in the early 1950s, you know, just looking at solid stain chromosomes, looking for trisomies like trisomy 21, right the way through uh, to 2000, and when there was a real shift in genomic medicine delivery. And we know that the UK is recognised worldwide as a leader in genomics, and the unique structure of the NHS has actually allowed us to deliver advances in both genetics and genomics at scale and pace for patients benefit over the 20 years of the last 20 years given this genomic revolution that we've been sort of hearing about briefly so the nhs is also a world leading healthcare system and in its use of cutting edge genomic technology it's also put us at the forefront of of genetics and genomics so in the nhs we can deliver faster and more accurate diagnoses for inherited and acquired diseases as we heard from Gemma. Uh, we can also provide um, acquired disease and personalized treatments to those acquired diseases and interventions 
and it's allowed us to be more effective in predicting and preventing certain conditions before they even develop. It's also provided us with an opportunity to have a role to enable the NHS to harness the power of genomic medicine and science to improve the health of our populations as part of our commitment to NHS long-term plan, which is one of our strategies in NHS England. And we're doing all of this through our genomic medicine services. So if I can have the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about some of the major landmarks and some of these have been, been touched upon, but just to sort of give you a little bit of, of, of uh, flavor for some of the things that have impacted on genomics in the NHS. Of course, we've heard about the Human Genome Project, which was an international project that sequenced all of the genes found in humans. This was a major part of the genomic revolution and accurately sequenced the three billion nucleotide-based pairs of the human genome. So this led in 2012 to David Cameron, who was then the Prime Minister, uh, to announce a paradigm shift in the way that the NHS would use genomics. And it committed the UK to sequencing 100,000 genomes. That's interesting, why 100,000 genomes? Well, apparently David Cameron thought that that would be a good figure to aim for. So we sequenced whole genomes from patients with rare inherited diseases and common cancers. And in 2015, the NHS England Board announced an NHS-wide strategic approach to personalised medicine, which was also going to be based on some of the findings from the 100,000 Genome Project. So we started to build uh, the NHS status as one of the most advanced healthcare systems. And in 2018, the genomic medicine services were launched these were run out of uh, seven genomic laboratory hubs and in November 2020 whole genome sequencing was introduced as a technology for diagnosing patients as we heard from from Gemma with rare diseases and cancer and from 2020 onwards the NHS has continued to introduce uh, new tests and services that have revolutionized care and you know as Gemma has said it's not just about the genomics but it's actually about embedding these in clinical pathways and involving clinicians looking at all the symptoms that people the patients present with in order to be able to uh, diagnose them. So we've been able to revolutionise care, and um, including uh, the world first bedside test to prevent hearing loss in babies. We've introduced pharmacogenomic testing for DPYD genes, testing for monogenic diabetes, as, we, as we've already heard uh, from Gemma. Uh, we've also been able to uh, support cutting edge gene therapies and precision cancer treatments. Can I have my next slide, please? So we've been able to deliver the 100,000 genome working in partnership, not just uh, with Genomics England, but with also with our National Institute of Health Research with Public Health England and Health Education England. Um, we delivered whole genome sequences from our NHS patients. So these were actually patients with rare diseases and cancer who were being seen in the NHS by clinicians, either clinical geneticists or specialist clinicians um, in their normal um, healthcare pathways. Uh, the recruitment was undertaken through 13 NHS genomic medicine centres. I had the privilege of, of being a, the uh, scientific director of one of those genomic centres across the northwest coast. And again, like I said, all of our patients were part of our routine care. They were part of our routine testing channels. And the programming actually involved all devolved countries, not just NHS England, but, but our four nations. There were some principles that the 100,000 Genome Project was based on. The principles of, you know, whole genome sequencing as a diagnostic test, which had never really been done before in the NHS. As I said, recruiting from routine care. Our participants were consented so that we could use and share their data for uh, research and development and for industry use and for longitudinal access to look at, you know, uh, cases right the way through um, a, a time uh, frame. It provided us with an opportunity to establish models for transformational change and we really did change our genomic services and the way that we delivered genetic testing in the NHS. But it also helped us to align genomic research and discovery into our clinical practice and be able to do that a lot quicker than we've been able to do that in the, in the past. 
And some of the outcomes really did benefit our patients. And they've driven, as I've said, that transformation in the way that we deliver genomic in the NHS. Yes. It's enabled us to embed new scientific discoveries and, and make some real medical insights um, in, in the delivery of our care. And we've been able, um, to, through this ethical and transparent program, which was based on consent, uh, provide a real kickstart to the development of UK uh, genomics industry. Can I have my next slide, please? So the building infrastructure of the genomic medicine service was launched in um, October 2018 and it was a, a world first structure for integrated healthcare systems using genomics. To enable the NHS to harness the power of genomic technology and these scientific advances, um, we were able to um, embed what we learned from the 100,000 Genome Project into these seven genomic medicine service hubs um, through our genomic laboratory testing uh, facilities. So our patients, as I said, continued as they were recruited in the 100,000 Genome Project now in our genomic services continue to be recruited through either our clinical geneticists or through routine care. Um, our genome laboratory um, hubs uh, undertake the testing. Um, that testing is predicated and informed by a national test directory. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, we have a national provision now for whole genome testing as routine, um, and we also that's also underpinned by our, our bioinformatics uh, facility. And all of that information is embedded in a national genome research library, which enables researchers um, and, and industry partners to discover uh, from these approved, the, uh, the, to discover new, new, new findings, to, to put that data into real innovation. Um, but all of that information, you know, it is um, uh, um, enabled to, 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 to be um, embedded into this uh, library by our pa patients who continue to consent for all of their information, not just their genomic whole genome sequence, but their whole clinical record uh, to be embedded into these libraries. And our collaboration with Health Education England has in, enabled us to then build a training program, not just for our genomic um, workforce who are working in our genomic services, but also broadly all of our, our clinicians and nurses and, and other um, healthcare practitioners who are working out in the NHS to understand the real importance of, of undertaking genomic testing. So there were some key principles to the way that we stood up our services. They were, these were to be clinically and scientifically led. Um, we needed them to have the involvement of patients and public at all levels. Um, we wanted to ensure that we had an equity of access. So any patients pitching up in the south of England would have the same um, testing, the same services if they were if they were pitching up in London or, or anywhere else in the country. We wanted our services to enable rapid access to precision and targeted treatments. And also we standardised our model of delivery through um, national commissioning across the whole country. Our services are responsive to innovation and new technologies, and, and all of this is done piecemeal right the way across uh, all of our genomic hubs. And our hubs inform and drive change, and they use data to lead any of these insights. Um, can I have my next slide, please? So there are some really interesting facts to focus on, and I'll, I'll just pick out uh, a few. So in implementing um, our genomic medicine service, we now have over 203 cancer clinic and indications that cover the majority of solid and uh, hematological malignancies. We have about 357 rare disease clinical indications in our test directory that are operated across all of our genomic services, and these cover over 3,200 rare diseases and growing. As uh, Gemma previously mentioned, our whole genome sequencing services are delivering a diagnostic yield of 30 to 40 percent in general, and for some of our cancer conditions, over 60 percent of the diagnostic yields uh, are being achieved. And underpinning all of this, we have patient and public voice representation, and they're embedded in the genomics unit at NHS England to help critique and analyze and decide on future approaches. Um, can I have my next slide, please? <laughs> 
So our genomic laboratory hubs are delivering a breadth of genomic testing through the use of the National Test Directory. And our, te our test directory, as I said previously, has a full repertoire of cancer and rare disease testing. And we have a standardized gene panel that's tested in each of our genomic laboratory hubs. So like I said, there's a standardized way of, of testing for, for all of our, our referrals. Some of our GLHs, are all, or rather all of our GLHs have a core repertoire of tests that they all deliver, but some of our um, GLHs deliver specialist testing. For example, neurogenetic testing is delivered between two to five of our GLHs. And there are some national services that are just delivered in one GLH on behalf of the whole country. So for example, neonatal whole genome panel testing. And what makes this all possible is the National Genomic Test Directory, and I'll say a little bit more about that in my next slide, which is the only such compendium of tests in the world. So the test directory is updated every year. Um, it's following submissions from new tests for consideration. Uh, these are evaluated and based on clinical and scientific evidence that's put forward by our test evaluation groups. Um, and these are made up of clinical experts and patient and public voice representatives. And the test directory is developed also through looking at best exemplars that are used and best exemplars of testing that are used right the way across the world. Can I have my next slide, please? So genomics is also driving a, a revolution in personalised medicine. And we heard a little bit about this from Gemma around the early diagnosis and reducing that diagnostic odyssey. Um, but we're also getting greater diagnostic yield out of the um, testing that we're now doing in our genomic medicine centres and our hubs. So we're able to now more precisely diagnose um, our patients, providing clearer identification of their underlying cause of their diseases and also able to segment uh, into, into conditions, especially for our cancer patients. Now, we do know that the NHS spends over 15 billion on medicines each year, and currently key medicines are, the, uh, are effective in only about 30 to 60 percent of patients. So in, in enabling us through this precision medicine to more effectively effectively um, diagnose our patients, we're also able to more effectively treat them using precise diagnosis, allows better treatment selection and increases our the effectiveness of those treatments that we do have. And it also allows us to repurpose some of the existing uh, medicines. Some of the other things that we do know is that in our hospitals, one in 15 admissions in the UK are linked to adverse drug reactions. And Gemma also mentioned this earlier, that being able to precisely diagnose our patients, we are also able to see fewer um, adverse events. We can also provide monitoring and early signs of recurrence in our patients, especially our cancer patients. And we're also, to, we're also able to increasingly uh, provide more clinical trials because our patient we can we can actually show that our patients are more eligible for for clinical trials that are out there due to the better characterization of their conditions and we're able to provide our patients with better prognosis and more preventative approaches can i have the next slide please so there are a wide range of examples that people you know can't help but notice in the press uh, you know on, on the television and tv media um, what I will do is just pick out a couple of these. I've already mentioned the DPYD testing and so thousands of our cancer patients are benefiting from the introduction of this testing, which can prevent adverse drug reactions. And also, you know, thousands of our patients are also benefiting from NTRK gene fusion testing um, in order to support new histology and dependent cancer treatments. We've also been able to roll out non-invasive prenatal diagnosis for retinoblastoma, and this is just one of more than 15 new test amendments that's been added to the National Test Directory this year. Can I have my next slide, please? So what about the future and, and what, do, what future challenges uh, does genomics hold for us? Well, we're currently able to test routinely um, 
all our cancer patients' at diagnosis um, to inform treatment approaches. And what we want to do is to move more and more into uh, wider panels, more whole genome uh, uh, sequencing. And what we want to also do is move away uh, using these ranges of technologies. We want to move away from that one size fits all medicine so that we can more personalize our treatment for patients. And we're opening more pathways and providing resources to offer testing to all cancer patients by a genomic educated workforce and we're working very closely with Health Education England in order to provide this um, education. We're also working on multi-module approaches to get the best outcomes for our patients. We're undertaking many pilots uh, using next generation sequencing for gene panels. We're looking at short read whole genome sequencing. We're looking at long read sequencing and we're also looking at testing for cell-free DNA. And all of these pilots are, um, are sort of bringing to fruition more and more technologies and innovations that we can embed into uh, the NHS. As I mentioned earlier, we're also able now to provide early entry into clinical trials and we're doing this as a priority and we're working very closely with pharmaceutical companies so we can understand what are the right tests that we need to be doing so that we can test our patients for stratification. We've got genomic and clinical outcome data that's currently being collated to provide that longitudinal research uh, for interpretation of results, especially those more difficult uh, patients to, to diagnose. Um, but we're also providing um, more and more information that's going to be used for by our researchers and industry partners. We're providing standardization of testing, we're providing interoperability across our whole healthcare system so information can be shared right the way across our healthcare professionals through data sharing and we're addressing many of the information governance issues that previously were left unresolved, we're now able to resolve those. So genomic data from thousands of our patients has now been stored securely and with the consent of our patients um, it's been that where it's been used by researchers to help develop new treatments and we're utilizing expert knowledge um, within academia and across the world to increase the benefits of genomic testing for patients um, and our populations can I have my next slide please So this is a quote by Craig Venter, and I think this quote brings us back to where we started uh, based on the timeline in my first slide. Craig Venter said, I'm hoping that these next 20 years will show what we did 20 years ago in sequencing the first human genome was the beginning of the health revolution that will have more positive impact in people's lives than any other health event in history. I think we can all agree that the health revolution is well and truly underway. My name is Angela Douglas and I've been in geno a genomic clinical scientist in the NHS for over 40 years. Our next speaker this evening is Vivian Parry. Vivian is a science writer and broadcaster. I think when she starts speaking, many of you will recognise her voice if you don't already know her. Um, she is Head of Engagement at Genomics England and she's sat on many boards over the years, but most recently she's been a member of the Board of UK uh, Research and Innovation. So I want to do, and I'm going to do a kind of wobbly effect that you see on the films, I want to take you back exactly a decade. And exactly a decade ago, we were five years, five days away from the first event of the London Olympics. It was women's football, if you're asking. And the Prime Minister at the time, as you've already heard, wanted something good to announce. Plus ça change. And he announced that there would be 100,000 genome sequenced. And it was a plot cooked up by Sir John Bell and uh, Sir John Chisholm, who later became the first chief executive and chairman of Genomics England, and David Cameron, who of course had a child with a genetic condition. And it was announced, and I imagine that David Cameron had thought, as, as, uh, uh, as you've heard from Angela, that 100,000 sounded like a good round number. And he said, is that okay? And both the Johns gulped and said, yes, Prime Minister. 
actually, <laughs> it turned out that, of course, nobody had ever sequenced 100,000 genomes before. We're right back before sequencing was the very commonplace thing that it is now. And I rang Sir John recently and I said, is it true that there were lots of people who didn't think that it was possible? And he said, no, actually, that's not true. He said, everyone thought that we couldn't do it. I couldn't find a single person who thought that it was possible to sequence 100,000 genomes. We started with a Bake Off. Now, Bake Off, we sent the same genome to lots of different providers. And what happened was every single one of them came back with a different answer. At the beginning, the cost of a genome that we were quoted was around £10,000. Well, that wasn't going to become a regular NHS test for sure. So lots of things had to change. And I think some of the, the things that we thought were going to be most difficult were the things related to the sequencing and the analysis. Actually, they turned out to be relatively easy compared to some of the other things like making it work within a health system and making it a smooth kind of seamless end-to-end -end transition because we had always intended, and the whole point was that this started with the patient and that it ended with the result going back to the patient. And there were all sorts of bumps and hiccups along the way. One of them was uh, with cancer. So we started out with cancer. Then we discovered that the way that, that tumours are normally preserved with something called uh, FFP, fixed formalin paraffin embedded, was a bit like kind of a moth had been at DNA. There were bits missing all over the place. So we had to start on a system which had not been used in the NHS before, which was fresh frozen. It involved writing completely new pathways. Uh, all this time, the people in the NHS who were doing this were completely magnificent because basically all of this was piled on top of them, of their everyday jobs. And it was extraordinarily difficult. We had standard operating procedures, I remember, and we discovered that there were, it, there were no less than a thousand different ways that people were doing a standard operating procedure. That had to be sorted out. So there were all sorts of things. But I was brought into Genomics England, uh, not because of my great technical knowledge. I actually did uh, genetics at university. I was a complete failure at it. I was bored to tears by Mendel and his peas, but I was absolutely riveted by DNA. And I always remember as a BBC broadcaster standing in front of the cameras when the first draft of the Human Genome Project came out and saying, this will be with us in three to five years. And that was more than 20 years ago. So clearly it's taken a while. Actually, we did say it was going to be three to five years for almost everything. I remember saying in Tomorrow's World that uh, electric cars will be with us in three to five years. And actually, we'd said that for 30 years on Tomorrow's World and we still were never found out. But anyway, I digress. So I was brought in because one of the things that I was passionate about was public engagement. And when we started the 100,000 Genomes Project, it was at the time of care.data. And the care.data was um, a kind of botched attempt to uh, use GP data. And it caused enormous distrust. And so you have that thing about data and people being concerned about it. Then you have the data from genomes, people feeling particularly uh, it, that it's particularly personal and of course it affects not only them but also uh, their close family and finally the other element and I throw this out to you because since the human genome project uh, what the draft was uh, announced there have been nearly 800 episodes of CSI and you might think why is she mentioning CSI it was because people get more of their information about genomics from CSI than they have ever got from, I suspect, educators on genomics. And we knew as well that we had to persuade not just patients, we knew that people who had rare disease or who had cancer, and remember that the people who came in on the cancer arm of the 100,000 Genomes Project, 
had no thought ever that they would get a diagnosis back or information that would be helpful for them in the treating of their cancer. They knew that that wasn't possible. They were just doing it because they wanted uh, to uh, help. It was an altruistic move. But for people who came in with rare disease, they very much wanted to find out what was the problem because most of them were undiagnosed. So we knew that the rare disease community was very much with us. Of course, they had red lines about things like uh, insurance. Uh, they wanted to uh, their data to be uh, secure. They wanted privacy, all those kind of things. But actually, it was the public that we were more concerned about, partly because of care.data. But also, you have to remember that the public and patients are two really different communities. And they have different views. And it's often the public's view that drives headlines in newspapers. It's not patients' views. So we had to do a lot to make sure that what we did was trusted. One of the things was we set up a participant panel. And the reason we did that is because not only should they have a say in what goes on, but it also demonstrated that if people wanted access to the data, that they had to come through people like them who had skin in the game, or rather DNA, uh, in the National Genomic Research Library. And that was a very important part of being trusted, because what you can't do is go out and say to people, trust us. You have to be trustworthy. And that's a rather different thing. So there we were with our participant panel, we were working with uh, the, the public. We did a lot of public engagement to find out what people thought, what their views were. And I want to put it out there that public, uh, what public engagement is not. So what public engagement is not is education. We are not educating people. There are many fantastic sources of information that we're very glad to point people to but we are not there to educate them. And indeed, one of the things that we've discovered is that the way that people who are involved in genomics want to talk about it frequently starts with the science and the benefits, and it switches a lot of people off, just in the same way that I was rather switched off by Mendel and his P obsession. There are lots of people who are very switched off when we talk about science, but it's the comfort blanket that a lot of people cling to and they want to tell people and assume that if they have that information then they will immediately trust. We know that that's not the case. The other thing that we're not trying to do is we're not trying to persuade. We can talk to people, we can keep answering their questions, we can do all of those things but it's not for us to say you shall do this, you should do this. It's for people to make their own decisions. And if they can feel that to be involved is a choice and a choice that they might want to take, then that's the way to go. Not a feeling that they have to, they're obligated. All of those things we know are turnoffs to the public. So let me get to where I see uh, genomics going uh, in the future, because one of the things that people think felt that once we'd got over the first part of uh, the 100,000 and there hadn't been any major newspaper headlines and it was all going fine, that actually that was it, job done. And in my view, the job is never done. We're always just one headline away from people turning away from this new science. So I think that um, one of the things we have to persuade people, first of all, is that it's it's not new science. I mean, yes, we're celebrating Gregor's uh, centenary, bicentenary, but I think the, the thing that we have also discovered from the public is that if we present genomics as being something very whizzy and futuristic, then they really get quite alarmed by it. Whereas if we present it as being another way of doing medicine, then they're much more comfortable with it. The other thing that deeply alarms me is that there's a real danger that if we don't talk to people properly, that we will end up with a two-tier system. 
we know that because of the uh, variation across the human genome, that there are some communities who are not represented in the data sets, which are primarily Northern European, and that we really need to make sure that those communities are properly represented, because otherwise there will be two things will happen. First of all, people will come along, we will discover a variant of unknown significance, and we won't be able to tell people whether that's important or not, and that really matters. And the other thing is, is that if we don't tell people about this and we allow people to just think that this is something that's awful and dreadful, and they will become further disadvantaged as we, we all those people who are already disadvantaged will become further disadvantaged if they don't have access to genomic medicine or don't want to play a part in it. So that's a really important part of the future. And it's certainly something that we're doing in uh, Genomics England through our uh, 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 data diversity group. So what are the other areas that I think that we need to worry about for the future? Well, one of the things is that although many, many people who work in genomics are really good at talking to the public of what, what they do, much of it is very small scale and it's also talking to people that are either already interested or to people who have a reason to be involved in genomics, perhaps because they have a, a relative with a condition or they have a condition themselves that they think is appropriate for genomics. So we need to get beyond that because it's very small scale and we need to get to uh, a big section of the public. And that means using things like, well, CSI gets to an enormous number of people and the conventional media still have an enormous reach, but we need to find out which types of media are most appropriate to which communities. As I said, not to persuade, not to educate, but to allow people to have discussions. And I think that genomics is very similar in some ways to vaccine confidence, and that it's not just a matter of telling people, it's a matter of talking, listening, understanding what the concerns are, and then talking again, talking a bit more. It's something that's very familiar to people like Gemma and genetic counselors. And the other thing that I think that we need to do is bring together the whole of the genomics ecosystem. I'm very struck by something that happened that I did a lot of work on when I was at the BBC, which was about GMOs. And we had one company, you may remember that Monsanto introduced a non-squishy tomato. And the whole of the public turned against it. And what happened because of one rogue player was that GMO research was halted for a decade. We can't allow that to happen with genomics because of the potential benefits that it has for so many. So I think that we need to work together with the rest of the genomics ecosystem and that we need to collaborate on the understanding the kind of messages that need to go out. For instance, that there is always a choice, that, uh, that it, you know, the police aren't involved, that you can't use DNA uh, taken, it's not going to be put at a crime scene. There you are, CSI again. But all those things need to get out into a much, much bigger audience. So uh, Genomics England was starting a big piece of work called Welcome Connecting um, uh, Science, where we're going to uh, bring together everybody from industry to the professional organisations to work together and then to test which communication approaches would work best for which types of messaging. And that's all the more important because we're now moving, as you're about to hear from my colleague David Vick at Genomics England, into newborn uh, sequencing. This is newborn screening. And here we're working not with patients, we're working with the public. And we need to be very sure that we can uh, bring everybody together because 
if we do this program and we do not include the full range of the British public, then we will be failing. And we're doing something, it's the first time in the world that it's it's been done on this uh, scale, that the whole world is watching. So we have to get our communications with the public right, because if we don't do that for the future, then genomics will not succeed as we all uh, wish it to. I'm going to move on now to this evening's final speaker, Dr. David Bick. And David is the clinical advisor at Genomics England Newborn Genomes Programme. And he was previously the chief medical officer at the Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology. And he was medical director of the Smith Family Clinic for Genomic Medicine. The part that I'm going to play tonight is to talk a little bit about where we're going and the work that we're doing in Genomics England to start to think about and uh, move forward with a newborn genomes program. So I think a little bit of background is in order. There was a very large public engagement in 2021 where folks were asked in England, what do they think of a whole genome sequencing program as an adjunct to newborn screening? And there was a great deal of enthusiasm for looking at the genome, but very particularly to look for treatable genetic conditions that could be treated starting in childhood. And so with that background, I wanna go backwards a little bit and just talk about the current newborn screening program in the NHS. It has been extremely successful. It is very widely accepted by the public. At this point, it contains nine conditions, which you can see on the slide. And it was thought that we might want to try to expand the number of conditions on the list and to consider a broader approach. And that approach being whole genome sequencing to look at many more treatable conditions. So funding was uh, arranged and the program started uh, actually in earnest uh, late last year. And there were sort of three areas that we're uh, trying to explore. One is the obvious one, which I mentioned, which is to look for treatable genetic conditions that we can identify right away in the newborn period. And we want to explore really the benefits, challenges, and really the practicalities of offering whole genome sequencing as a screen in newborns. And this is a very important notion of the practicalities because we're working very closely with the NHS to see how this, if it, if it makes sense to do, how this can be integrated into the existing system. This is an ethics approved uh, research pilot and it has been essential at every step to think about some of the ethical and social implications of each of the things we do as we're moving along. Another aim of the program is to ask the question, could we use this information to advance research and very particularly to help us identify new treatments for these rare genetic conditions, some of which, many of which do not have a treatment. And then the last and perhaps speculative part of the uh, program is to ask the question, could we use these genomes across the lifespan of these individuals? So an example was given earlier of pharmacogenetics, a child who has, who develops um, uh, ADHD, hyperactivity, some of those children may need medication. And it turns out that you can look at certain pharmacogenetic variants and that can give the doctor a very good idea of which medication might work. So a few key numbers about the program. I think the first is that we would like to start the program in 2023. And there's obviously a great deal of work, which I'm gonna talk about in a few moments that needs to lead up to that. There's estimated to be nine children born each day in the UK with a treatable rare condition and I'd be happy to provide the numbers to back that up. We're uh, funded to sequence 100,000 newborns, and we estimate that 
perhaps as many as 500 of those individuals could be identified with a treatable condition. So why are we using whole genome sequencing? Well, the technology allows us to look for all kinds of different changes in our genome. It's also very flexible. As new genes are identified that are now treatable, we can add those to the list of treatable conditions that we're looking for. It's future-proofed to a degree because we can use the old genomes and the new genomes exactly the same way in terms of finding conditions. And this will obviously support discovery, but it's also very helpful in this potential lifetime use where you can find all of the DNA changes that might be helpful in an individual's uh, lifetime. We're very sensitive and very thoughtful about the uh, public dialogue and public engagement. This is extremely important to the program as Viv has, has pointed out. And at every step and in each of our groups where we've brought the public uh, to, to be involved in it and also many of the rare disease groups around the, around the country. There is an NHS steering group, which is made up of individuals from the public, NHS administration, from the uh, different rare disease organizations, physicians, nurse midwives are really overseeing all of the aspects of this program as it goes forward. And we have been in contact with literally hundreds of specialists around the country because as you can imagine, they will be very important when we find one of these conditions to actually be able to reach out and chat with these families uh, when we find one of these treatable conditions. So there are sort of six elements to really focus on when we think about designing such a program. One is what we call the conditions framework, which is establishing some principles for deciding which genes we should put on the list. And I'm gonna speak about that in a bit, a little bit later. There is the issue of identifying individuals who would like to be part of the program. And here we expect to speak to parents, couples, when they are during the last trimester of pregnancy to recruit them into the program. Another important part, which I alluded to before was the consent element, but the general um, approach to both the ethics and the social aspects of this program. We are acutely aware of the need to engage, not with, to engage with all of the minority communities around the UK, because that's going to be very important to the success of the program. We've also been thinking about what sample to take. Um, for those of you who've had children and who've had the newborn screen, they took a little bit of blood from the child's heel and put it on a blood spot card. Now that may turn out to be a perfectly satisfactory way to look for, to examine a person's genome, but we're also examining the possibility of simply taking umbilical cord blood which is readily available at birth, or just a simple cheek swab from the infant. Another important design element is to think about the returning of results. We need to have a system to collect the sample, sequence it, identify those DNA changes worthy of reporting, and then quickly get that information to the physician and then on to the parents. We'd like to see this happen in a couple of weeks. The other obvious important part is the care pathway that those specialists have thought through for how they will speak to parents and what they would do to treat that child. But equally important and something that has been repeatedly discussed in all of our meetings is really the support that we give to those parents when we're calling them up and then following those initial phone calls to make sure that they're rapidly getting in to see physicians, but they're also being armed with the information to explain how the treatments could work and how we can help their children. So uh, just a moment about the uh, conditions framework work group. This was a, a group that was set up late last year and has been working for the last um, since the end of last year to identify those principles for 
choosing the conditions and the genes. But it's important to realize that we're not only going to choose the conditions and the genes, we're going to choose the actual DNA changes that we want to look for in the children, because we want to be certain that when we flag a child, we want to be as certain as we can that we've identified a child who has a condition. And so this work group has been working diligently to identify uh, principles. And you can see to the right those draft principles, which we believe now having consulted both with the public and experts in the next couple of weeks, next month or so, we plan to uh, finalize those principles and start applying them to genes. Now, your question would be, well, what genes are you going to look at? One of the chief medical officer of Genomics England, Richard Scott and myself have put together a paper and developed a website which contains more than 700 treatable genetic conditions. This is one of a number of resources that we're using to identify the genes that may be worthy to put on the panel and to which we will start to apply those, those draft principles that I mentioned. So if you wanna learn more about the newborns program, I would encourage people to go to this website. I just wanna end on sort of a personal note. I've practiced clinical genetics for more than 30 years and I've run whole genome sequencing laboratories for more than 10 years. And the idea that we could actually identify children with very treatable conditions before they developed symptoms is absolutely amazing. And it's one of the most exciting projects I've ever been involved in, in my genetic career. I also really want everybody to know how big the team is. Now you're seeing here the key people who are heavily involved in the program, but there is a very much larger group at Genomics England who are also involved in the program. And there have been literally hundreds of physicians around the country and many, many people from the public, including quite a number of couples who've just recently had children or who are currently pregnant, who are helping us with every along every step of the way for this program. What is the cost of, um, to the NHS of testing an individual's whole genome? Um, so I don't know who wants to, to go with this one. Um, Angela? Um, or yeah, I'm happy to, more than happy to start. I mean, obviously, the, the actual uh, test of the genome itself uh, running on, run on a sequence, I mean, we've got the, the, the test down to, you know, uh, less than £150 a test, which is far less at the moment than it costs to do some of the sequential testing that uh, uh, Gemma had, um, had notified. But, but the benefits of, of the test itself, and I know that might sound um, quite expensive, uh, you know, £150 to actually uh, run the test itself. Um, but the beauty of the current technology that we're using is that the, the more uh, genomes we run together, so if we can run three, 400 genomes in one day, then it reduces the costs because the machines can actually run that number of, of, of patients' genomes. Um, and so it's that this is why it's really important that we... Um, um, centralize and standardize some of the testing that we do so that we can we can maximize how we use our technology so that we can reduce the cost and we believe that the more that we do that and with all the automation that we're currently introducing the cost will only come down. Uh, Vivian. I was just going to say that the technology in this area is advancing at enormous speed so things that we thought about at the beginning of the 100,000 Genomes Project have completely changed. I mean, for instance, the idea of storing genomes, we might not need to do that in the future because actually it will be so cheap with things like, you know, Nanopore and all those kind of technologies coming along that it may be just better to just do it there and then and a the whole genome really won't won't cost very much at all. And for comparison, by the way, on costs, an MRI is about £600. So it's it's pretty cheap now compared to the three billion that the first one cost. If no one else wants to come in, because we've got a whole bunch of questions, I, I shall move on. The next one is from um, an anonymous attendee, and it's a little more of an ethical question. Um, how do we balance choices 
around not passing on genetic conditions with ensuring that society continues to value those living with genetic conditions and disabilities? I think this is a, a question that comes up a lot. And I think um, I think I'll go to, to uh, Gemma first and then um, perhaps Viv will want to come in. Hi, I, know, I think it's a great question. Um, it, it's a really important question. Um, so I, um, I work with a, a rare disease um, charity and I think one, of, one aspect of this is to make sure that people who are affected by genetic conditions and people who have disabilities, ha um, voices are heard. Um, I think that's, that's one of the most important things. I think, you know, it, we, we have to think about this as a society and what, and what our values are and, and how accepting we are as a society of difference. And I think that, you know, that, that's a really important concept and, you know, something that, you know, I personally feel very passionate about. Um, so, um, yeah, come along to Rarefest <laughs> where we will be in November, where we will be raising the voices of um, the rare disease community. I think we, the more we can learn about the biology, the genetics of conditions, the better, really. And I think that applies both to... You know, screening newborns or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis but I do think we've got to be incredibly careful about even the way we use terms like disability uh, in my book Mindshift I talk a bit about neurodiversity and you know condition like autism spectrum disorder the very word disorder defines it as, as a disability disorder and of course there are forms of autism that are incredibly debilitating and, 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 and a problem um, but equally we, we know there are and talented autistic individuals, same with ADHD. My son was diagnosed with ADHD. In many ways, it was a very useful diagnosis it helped us to explain why he was having problems in his in his levels. But you know, there's lots of evidence showing that people with ADHD can be incredibly creative. I think the creative industry is simply quite heavily weighted towards people with with ADHD. So it's important to remember that these are spectrums, and also we we still know very little about some of the conditions that affect the brain. So brilliant to know more and to start thinking about ways we can help people but very careful not to use it to label these things as disorders because that could you know lead to eugenics and all sorts of areas that we don't want to get into. Vivian is there anything you want to add there? From yeah I would work? just add that the purpose of all of this is to help people lead the best possible lives and no matter what condition you have inevitably there will be a symptom or more that actually is impeding the way you live your life and people want help with those and if genomics gives you additional information that may either help you right now or else lead to ideas in the in, in the future that might prevent that particular element of your life that is causing you a lot of trouble uh, from happening then I think a lot of um, the rare disease patients that I've talked to are very welcoming of that but again, I always go back to it's about choice. Right, I'm going to move on now. I'm going to hop about in the questions a little bit. I'm going to go for one from now from Melanie Redman, who's just amended her question. Um, and she says, um, this is for, for you, um, David. Um, of the nine children born each day with a treatable um, genetic condition that you mentioned, how many of these would be picked up on the routine Guthrie screening, that, that which is what we currently have, um, or could be picked up by non-genetic biochemical screening? I had done a little calculation that uh, those nine conditions in, represented, I believe about one in 500 births uh, compared to the all of the 700 or so um, where we know a, where we have a, a frequency of disease, which is not all, all 700 of them, um, which is about one in 200. And so you do get some important conditions uh, from that list that's currently being screened, but it's very clear that there's quite a number that we could add using whole genome sequencing that would allow us to look for a whole bunch more that are treatable. We started with just one test for PKU and we started adding more tests and about 10, 15, maybe it was 20 years ago, they started using um, a tandem, mass tandem mass spectrometry, which can now be used to look for perhaps 50 conditions. But the challenge is 
that you keep using up more and more of that blood spot to get each additional condition. And every time you add a condition, you have to find a chemical that represents that condition. And so you really spend a huge amount of money to add each one of the conditions that you wanna add. And that's been a challenge for every group around the world that has used, for example, tandem S spectroscopy um, to identify conditions. And so what we can do with these biochemical tests is very important and has been very useful. But what we can get to with whole genome sequencing is we could add all at one time two or three or 400 different conditions. There is an issue that we need to chat about with respect to sensitivity and specificity when you come to whole genome sequencing, but that might be a chat for a different time. Thanks, David. Now there are a, a bunch more questions about whole genome sequencing of um, babies and children. So one's directed to Angela um, saying, wouldn't it be better to reserve whole genome sequencing um, for babies, children with undiagnosed diseases, enabling resources to be focused on patients in need. Um, so I think, you know, that's sort of quite, um, you know, a sort of one for you, but also, I mean, because the person goes on to say there'd be a greater chance of being able to interpret the results um, if there were fewer samples to be sequenced and the turnaround time would be quicker, all those sorts of, you know, um, those issues. So I think if Angela does that and then perhaps um, David and Gemma could come in on this as, you know, running the sort of the, um, the Easter hub. So, yeah. I, I don't think we uh, specifically limit um, who we offer whole genome sequencing to. I think what whole genome sequencing or whatever is the most appropriate genetic test to be undertaken uh, is done so given what the evidence base shows would be the best outcome for that particular use case. And I know that we have introduced whole genome panels for neonates where you know there is an abnormality we do undertake quite a lot of genetic testing um are prenatally um where we have where there are you know given uh, you know pick when we've picked up um something that's of concern either through uh, the pregnancy through a scan or or, or through any of uh, um, um biomarkers that are, are tested um prenatally um uh, not quite sure whether if we just directed all of our genetic testing to prenatal diagnosis, um, whether that would uh, improve the outcomes for our patients and population because our cancer patients are a very um, important group of individuals who actually um, benefit and have much better outcomes if we're able to test them genetically and target their treatment more precisely um, to their cancer. And there's a lot of evidence uh, around uh, around that. So um, I think what we try and do when we're when we're building the national test directory is it is done based on uh, need and outcome. Okay, Gemma. And David? Yeah, I think it's just um, important to think about the fact that these are two different pots of money. So there's money in the NHS and there's money for research to establish that, to establish the justification for what you might, what might be offered in a cost-effective way within the NHS. So the newborn screening program is, is a research pilot program um, and the genomic medicine service within the NHS you know, is, is available for, for babies and children with undiagnosed illnesses. So we do have genomic testing in the NICU and PICU um, for children who, um, who are critically ill. We do have um, geno genome sequencing in the NHS for, for lots of different indications such as you know, early onset epilepsy or um, intellectual disability. So there's lots of, um, there is whole genome sequencing available to, for, for testing of children with undiagnosed conditions. That's already happening. Um, it's not it, it's, it's in the test directory, it's happening, and it's probably not happening uniformly across the country yet, but it's rolling out. Um, and then what um, um, David is talking about is a research program. So that's a different pot of money and you need to do research obviously to, to make decisions about what you're then going to be able to do within the NHS. And I'm sure one of the aspects that they will be looking at will be the health economic aspects of that program. 
David. Yes, Gemma and Angela are perfectly right. And the, the, the questioner asked exactly the right question, which is, what is what's, what's the best way to help the most people? So the newborn program, as was pointed, as Gemma and others have pointed out, is a research program. And we have very, very specifically focused on several issues that relate to this. One issue is parent acceptance, right? You can't have a, there's no point in doing this program if the parents think it's a terrible idea. We need the physicians who are involved to say, wow, I diagnosed this child before they even had symptoms. I didn't have to go to the intensive care unit and try and pull a damaged child out of the fire. But equally important is the economic consequences. And so one of the major efforts in this program is to examine the costs and the benefits using economic models, qualities, and so forth, to actually do that very careful economic analysis. And it's important to realize that as a research program, our job is to collect information which the NHS will make an assessment about whether this makes sense to use going forward. One of the reasons that I emphasized embedded in the NHS was because as we do the pilot program, we could easily do this in a way where we would get the samples quickly and run them through all of these pipelines and do all of these things in a pure research setting. And then if the NHS said, oh, this seems like a good idea, we would have done nothing to prepare for that possibility. So there are two important things to take home from this. One is, this is a research pilot. Our job is to collect the information. That's why we're so anxious to have, and why there's so much value in having this NHS steering group to sort of say, these are the kind of things. And that group, by the way, includes the current people who are running the current newborn screening program. They're involved in that steering group. So they're telling, or they're explaining and we're working to as a group to make sure that we get the information and then down the line, there will be an assessment of the parents acceptance, the physician acceptance and the economics of it. And then only then will decisions be made about whether this makes sense to commission or not. If you intend 100,000 neonates, will that mean another two, um, hundred thousand to include the parents for a sound result from a trio so that would be 300,000 genomes um, and how will the workforce cope with that who will counsel the patients um, initially midwives obstetricians genetic counselors all of which are sort of notoriously um, overstretched um, and then I think uh, there's a question about as well how long is the funding for long-term follow-up um, guaranteed um, here so I think if you could answer those David I'm very conscious of time and I want to go back to the whole panel with a final question so yes I promise to be very quick so on the first point which I think was about trios again we're trying to match this to the way a program would normally run. And so we're gonna do singletons. The second is that there's a concern about the workforce issues. And if we think about those 100,000, perhaps there'll be 500 positives and maybe there'll be some false positives. So let's say a thousand. Those thousand cases would be distributed across every specialist across all of England. And so for any given specialty, ophthalmology, neurology, the number of cases that would come to them for them to call the parents will be quite modest every year. I will also make the point that yes, geneticists and genetic counselors do a lot of work to do counseling, but I will say having spoken to several hundred of these specialists around the country myself, they do a lot in terms of understanding the genetics of their condition and explaining that to parents. And I believe there was a third question, third part to that. Um, yes, that was um, from just say, how long will people be followed up? Ah, the follow-up part is extremely important. 
We anticipate starting the program next year. We would like to have, after a couple of years, to have completed all of the samples. We will have a long-term follow-up program. We don't have all the details of that at this point, but yes, clearly you need to know not only who were the true positives, but you also want to know who were the false negatives. Thanks, David. So the question I'm going to throw to the panel at the end is one from Chris Talbot, and that is, um, when will A, all newborns, and B, all NHS patients be sequenced in the UK? So that's a nice bit of, you know, Vivian can go back to her um, tomorrow's world days and say three to five years. Um, but um, no, so I think that would be a nice note to end on for how far we've come from Mendel. So um, who would like to go first? Let's go to John first, because he's not spoken for a while. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd like to see it happen as soon as possible. I think we could learn so much because it raises so many ethical issues about how the information is used. And maybe just one thing to say is that although genome analysis is incredibly important and it's taken us so far, we should be aware that particularly for conditions that affect the brain, we still don't really understand conditions like schizophrenia, depression, um, even in neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's, there's so much still we don't really know about the biology. And that has an impact, I think, on how we can use that genomic information. So I think we should be aware that there's huge gaps in, in our understanding of these basic conditions. Maybe a lot less so for a condition that, say, affects the heart or, or a disease like cancer. I think partly because we do understand the biology better. So it is important, I think, to always go back to the, you know, the basic research and our understanding of, of these of the biology of what's going on, as well as what we can learn from the, the genomic information. So I just sort of throw it in as a caution really about the limits of genomic information. I mean, GWAS has, has, has proved very important, but I have to say for, say for something like schizophrenia, apart from maybe very extreme examples of schizophrenia and a condition like Alzheimer's early onset versions, we still don't really understand that much. And even that's having done the GWAS and there's a lot of questions about why that is. Okay, Angela. When do you think all will all be sequenced on the NHS? Um, I don't know. It's a really, really difficult question to, to say. And I, I think what I would say is there's still so much that we don't understand about the genome. And, and we've sort of, um, you know, John sort of talked a little bit about the whole epigenetics and, you know, the fact that we, you know, there's only 2% of the genome that actually codes for proteins. And, and we don't even understand what all of those proteins uh, do. Um, and, and I suppose my my take on this and having been a genetic genomic scientist for over 40 years, just because we can, should we? Um, and what would be the benefit of sequencing everybody when, you know, if we found something, but we didn't know what that what it meant? Um, how would how would that would that be more hindrance than help? Um, I suspect that it will come maybe in, in my lifetime, you know, maybe in the next uh, 20 years, uh, because a lot has happened looking back over the last 20 years, I suspect um, people will, you know, want it, whether they access it through the NHS or access it privately. I think there will come a time when, when you know, people will want to know what, what uh, their whole genome says about them. Um, I think in the NHS, we will continue to use whole genome sequencing um, to diagnose and, and to prevent where possible uh, illness um, and if that um, becomes cost effective and a good enough reason to do everyone then you know that's when we will start to perhaps do everybody. I don't think all, all people will be sequenced because I think people will always be asked whether they want to be or not whether they want to have their sequencing done or not and that tests will be offered to people and some people will decline. I think depending on their clinical need the rates of declining will will vary but if somebody isn't very sick and or has a really strong feeling about it they may say no so I think you know it will it will always be a choice and therefore we won't sequence everybody but maybe sequencing will be available to everybody. I always whenever I'm asked these, these questions I always say or I always think what do folks in England want? It really doesn't ra really matter what David wants or what Viv wants. Is you know what do folks in England who live here what do they want? And when when they feel comfortable with the science and the technology and the safety and and the storage and the whole issues with insurance, when they have some comfort around that, 
they'll say, you know, we really want to do this. And so I personally always ask my patients what they want. Great. And now, Viv? I don't think that we will be sequencing everybody. And I tell you why is because I think that what we'll do is we'll develop all sorts of tests which are based on the knowledge that we've gained from uh, genomes. And it won't be something that everybody needs to have done uh, unless, as ev everyone says, they want to have it done. And, you know, I, I, I just think of all the things that we don't know yet. And, you know, with the newborns, for instance, we still don't know why some children can have a variant that ought to be deadly or cause really severe symptoms, and yet they're walking around perfectly healthily. So there's so much we don't know. And after all, we have got the same number of genes as a starfish, but clearly we're not starfish. So there's an, <laughs> we've got a lot to find out that we don't know yet. And I don't think that whole genome sequencing will be offered, it will be routine. I think it'll be the knowledge from research on whole genomes.